I'm Jeremy Slater. And I'm Sean Crouch. Awesome. I have a question if we're just jumping right in. Yes, please. Um, so, last time we talked, I asked, you know, what's what's the goal for season two? You didn't know yet. Now that uh, the Rance family seems to be out of the picture, is it? <laughs> Is it the goal moving forward to have The Exorcist be kind of like an anthology series that is following these main characters to one investigation to the yeah. next? Is this like a... I, I look at Tomas and Marcus as like lethal weapon for demons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, that's a great one. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly... that's That was our intention from the show from the very beginning, which is that you can't tell a, a, a seven-year story about this uh, about one family that just keeps getting possessed over and over again without... The audience just kind of starting to hate you for, for putting one family through so much shit. So, so the idea is every year we'll have a different case. We'll have a different sort of possessed individual, a different family, and and but it's it's Marcus and Tomas and Ben and it's our priests, our recurring characters that you're going to follow and have that investment. Did you just say seven years? Is going to be a seven season show? We're six. I think six seasons. Six seasons in a movie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's our that's our aim. Um, and then we go into the, the, the Vatican this season and really get into that story with Father Bennett, and that's sort of the, hopefully that's our connective tissue in the mythology of the show uh, that could get, you know, that could go for six or seven seasons and hopefully have a very satisfying ending. We've sort of plotted it out very generally, just in case. So we know that we have an end point in mind for this, and we will answer every question, you know, at some point along the way. It's really important to us. Is it always possession, or is it, does it expand beyond that? I think, I think it has to always be possession because once we once you open that door pretty soon they're investigating were rabbits and chupacabras and stuff like that and it just it, just, it becomes a very different uh, story but that doesn't mean that we won't explore other cultures because i think if you look at other religions um, everyone has their own sort of um, demon, and demon myths story. And, and you know dibbics and jinns and, and demons they, they could all be different words describing the same entity. So so I do think that's going to be part of the show's DNA going forward of, of how how you can take elements from other cultures or other religions and use them in sort of this larger world. And we're going to do other types of horror. You know, we're going to do haunted house horror. Uh, but, I mean, it's, it's all demon-related, but we're also in, the, in this with nature. We're going to do nature horror this season with, with sort of connecting it to sort of J-horror and Ringu and Dark Water a little bit just to expand and evolve what type of horror we're able to do on this show. On that, on that subject, uh, Howard Thomas is uh, from Mexico. Are you planning to do something with the culture, the Day of the Dead, or something? Absolutely, like Santa yeah. Muerte. We, we talked about, about it a lot this year. The, the reason we can't is because it turns out Mexico is like the one area that's really hard to double in Vancouver. Um, originally we had some, some ideas for that and then it turns out it's just impossible to kind of convincingly pull off Mexico and Vancouver. But but if, if, if the show's lucky enough to, to move forward, um, it's... Tomas has a, a, a long backstory that we've barely begun to dive into, yeah. and I think at, at some point the show has to sort of address some of those things. We'd love to. I mean, if, if we had our way, season three would be in Los Angeles, and then we'd play the other half of the story would be in Mexico. Yeah. Be met across the border, almost like the bridge a little bit, but in an in a exorcist-type show, so we could really play with that culture, that very strong Catholic culture. Uh, a Catholic culture I grew up in as well. Um, I think it's really important to play with that, and I think it's a I think it's a great sandbox for season three. So, fingers crossed. You did a lot of visceral like uh, scenes and and uh, effects in season one that surprised me. Um, going into season two, have you gotten any sort of pushback from the network saying that's a bit too far? Actually, it's, it's the other way around. Um, you know, th there are a handful of words you can't say on network TV, and and nudity is fairly off limits. But other than that, um, it's kind of shocking the amount of stuff you can get away from. And, and Fox was endlessly supportive in the first year in terms of pushing the envelope. They wanted those water cooler moments, and so they were actually the ones pushing us to be like, could this be a little grosser? Could this be a little bit more intense? Um, which is a nice problem to have. Yeah, it's it's so creatively satisfying to have executives that are like telling us to do more. Because usually we're the ones doing more and they're pulling it back, so it's awesome. Are you going to delve any more into the relationship between Marcus and Tomas? Like they're, I don't know, if, I don't want to say bizarre friendship, their, their friendship is really intriguing to me, so what, are you going to go into Absolutely. that? Absolutely, I mean that's the heart of the show for us, and, and I think we're really playing at the beginning of this season, these two. They've been on the road for six months together, they've built up this brotherhood, and you know brothers can love each other, they can still fight with each other, they can still be intense with each other, but to us, that is the heart of the show. Yeah, and and 
and I think there's some interesting stuff to explore in, in season two. In season one, you saw, you know, Marcus was the expert and Tomas was the amateur. He was kind of bumbling. He had no idea what he was doing, and he made a lot of mistakes. So I think it's interesting to shift that dynamic once we get to year two and and, and place them on a more equal footing, where they're where he is now an accomplished exorcist in his own right, and seeing how they work as partners um, versus how they work as sort of an apprentice and a master. Um, it, it gives us some new dimensions and some new shades to play with the characters. What's the secret to doing horror on commercial uh, TV? Because obviously, even though you don't have too many restrictions in terms of violence or things like that, you still got to deal with these breaks <laughs> that you know would seem to be anathema to the steady building of tension in a horror story. So, you know, what is your approach to that? How do you? We we learn the hard way in season one. There's stuff that just doesn't work on TV. Jump scares don't work because the audio levels are crushed, and a jump scare is ninety percent. Um, auditory. Um, we also learned that you know you, you can't put your scary stuff at the at the, the top of an act. If someone's coming back from a Ford commercial, they're not going to be scared in <laughs> yeah. those first thirty yeah. seconds. Yeah. You have to you have to give it some time to build the atmosphere and dread and really hit them by the end of the act, and and then hopefully that fear carries them through the next commercial break, and then you build it again. So it, it really is sort of a roller coaster where you're constantly taking them on an up and down journey and, and sort of five times throughout the course of each episode. Yeah, as our very talented writer room breaks these stories we are constantly thinking about commercial breaks because it's it's we just we have to deal with that absolutely sorry guys that's all the time we have for that thank you, yeah. thank you very much